Thank you, Carolyn. I don't know if you realize, but Carolyn is one of the true stars in Canadian financial planning. There are maybe only eight or 10 people in the country that have made as big a contribution as she has been making for the past number of years. So you're very, very lucky to have her as a professor. So you, you just need to all know that. If, you, if that's not clear to you already, you should know that. I'm happy to be here. My name is John DeGuy, as Carolyn said, and I want to begin with a very quick show of hands. Who here has heard the Mark Twain quote, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. How many people have heard that? One, only one? Okay. So here's the fun thing about that quote, it's apocryphal, which is to say, uh, it's attributed to Twain, but there is no evidence anywhere that Twain actually said it or wrote it. And I find that really ironic and delicious because people think they know things, and it's not that they don't know it, the problem is they think they know it, but what they think they know is in fact wrong. So it's ironic and instructive in terms of what people think they know as they do their job. In the financial services industry, that's a real problem. We're gonna walk you through some of those problems because I don't think people are even aware of how bad the situation really is. So I wanna begin with a story about a, a doctor. His name is Ignaz Semmelweis. He's a Hungarian and he lived, uh, he practiced medicine in the mid 1800s in Vienna, Austria, the best research hospital in Vienna. And he found curiously that the women who were giving birth at the hospital were dying at three times the rate of the women that were dying, they gave birth at home using a midwife. So he thought, well, why could this be? And he's an intelligent guy and, and He's thinking about, well, how can I apply the scientific method and test hypotheses to see what the causation might be? So he came up with this idea of if the doctors at the hospital just wash their hands in a special solution before delivering the child, maybe that would have an impact. And he ran the, he ran the experiment with the control, had some doctors wash, had some doctors not wash, Ran the, ran the study for a long enough time to get a large enough sample size, and lo and behold, he proved unequivocally that washing your hands will have a major impact in reducing puerperal fever, childbirth, uh, death after childbirth, for, for women who give birth. What do you think his fellow doctors thought of him? They hated him. Instead of celebrating the major breakthrough that is beneficial to society, they hated him because he was a threat to them because of what they knew and what they thought they knew. And as far as they were concerned, they were part of the solution, not part of the problem. And how dare this guy Semmelweis come along and say that we are causing these deaths. So they closed ranks and collectively, they basically ran the guy out of town. They had him committed to an insane asylum and he died penniless. And it wasn't until many years after his death that he became revered as a hero for having been one of the pioneers in germ theory because in the 1850s, people didn't know about germs, which of course is what the real reason is here. So again, it ain't what you know that you don't know, it's what you know that you think you know that gets you into trouble. So this is something uh, that has now caused a, a phrase that is used in behavioral economics and behavioral finance called the Semmelweis reflex. There is a situation when people actually instinctively resist information that contradicts what they think they already know. And instead of being proponents of science and evidence and progress, people actively resist it because it con contravenes their own worldview. So I wanna tell you about a couple of studies that are important that I think you will be interested in learning. In Canada, about four out of five people who give financial advice have a mutual fund license. They are licensed to sell mutual funds and only about one out of four have a securities license. And there are some people who have insurance license, but not, it's, it's complicated. But on the, on the investment side, about four out of five have a mutual fund license only. And a paper came out almost eight years ago in late 2016 called The Misguided Beliefs of Financial Advisors. This study showed and it was a massive study. They looked at thousands of advisors and tens of thousands of household clients over more than a decade from two different mutual fund companies in Canada. And there's this, the research showed beyond any doubt that financial advisors chase past performance, 
didn't pay any attention to product cost and ran concentrated positions. They, they, didn't, they failed to diversify properly. Now, all three of those things are hopefully things that you would all know are conspicuously wrong. And the research showed that financial advisors were doing it, not only that people would say, well, they're doing it because they're getting a commission in the mutual fund. Uh, uh, uh. The research showed that these advisors did it even in their own accounts and even after they retired. So this is not a question of misplaced agency. This is a question of people believing things that are obviously not true. So now the question that it begs is, well, how could that possibly happen? Why? We're going to get into that in a minute, but I want to tell you about a second study. Uh, a second paper was written by Bill Sharp. Does anybody, has anybody here ever heard of William F. Sharp? Heard of the Sharp Ratio? Capital asset pricing model? Okay. So Bill Sharp wrote a paper in the Financial Analyst Journal in 1991, more than 30 years ago, called The Arithmetic of Active Management. And in it, he showed that the average passively managed dollar must, must outperform the average actively managed dollar. And it should be obvious, if the, if the TSX gets you an 8% rate of return over a certain time frame, and you've, you're trying to track that, pro, that benchmark using a passive product that costs 25 basis points, your return is going to be the return of the benchmark minus the cost of the product, 7.75%. We're all in agreement? Okay. Let's say you're using a mutual, or you're comparing those, the, the, the sum of the average, the average passive product, let's say, costs 25 basis points. Let's say the average F-class mutual fund product, actively managed, with no, no compensation to the advisor, costs 1.25%. Well, the market is nothing more than the sum of all active and passive managers. And if the passive managers are getting the return of the market before costs, that must mean the active managers are getting the return of the market before costs. And if the costs are 1.25, that means the average active manager is going to getting, getting a return of 6.75. Now, this is true in all asset classes, in all jurisdictions, in all time horizons. It's, it's immutable. And yet, mutual fund financial advisors don't pay attention to product cost. So what's going on here? Does anybody have any idea? Misinformation. Perfect. So I want to ask you if you know the difference between misinformation and disinformation. Uh, nobody wants to say anything. So I have a friend, let's call him Steve, who's a very prominent journalist here in Canada. And he and I were at a hockey game a while ago. And we were talking. And I, and I asked him, I wanted to say, Steve, you're a smart guy. What's the difference between misinformation and disinformation? And he says, John, I don't know that I can give you a really good answer, but I know it when I see it. Now, this is a smart guy, and he says he can know it when he sees it. So let me give you the dictionary definition. Misinformation is when you say something that's false, but you don't know it's false. You honestly believe it's true. It's unwitting. It might be an honest mistake, that sort of thing. Disinformation, on the other hand, is you know darn well it's false, and you say it anyway because you have the intent of misleading someone. So it's like the distinction between a lie and a falsehood. All lies are falsehoods, but not all falsehoods are lies, because if you say something that's false, and you believe it to be true for whatever reason, you're not guilty of lying. You're just spreading misinformation. It's when you know darn well that it's false that you're lying and spreading disinformation. So here we have a situation where financial advisors, mutual fund registrants, which is 80% of the people that are giving advice to Canadians retail investors, believe things that just ain't so. Now, do you think that might be a problem? <laughs> I would, hope, I would hope you would be terrified. So we're, we're now looking at a situation where I have a quote for you that I wanted to share because I think it's just so perfect. Uh, it's from Carl Sagan. It's, 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 it's this. If we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It's simply too painful to acknowledge even to ourselves, that we've been taken. Once you give a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. We're now living in a world where mutual fund registrants have been bamboozled by the industry. 
So why is that? And this is really important because I know that you're going to be going out into the workforce possibly as early as January. And my experience is that the bamboozle happens almost always in the first two years you're in the business. And it can be explained by social psychology. So I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Solomon Ash and Stanley Milgram. Solomon Ash would, would, would work with different uh, Confederates who would actually say, you know, which is the longer line? And then the, the, the people at the end, all the people were, were basically in on the game and they were lying about their answer. And then the last person would look at a line which was obviously longer or obviously shorter or obviously the same length. And he would give the wrong answer or she would give the wrong answer because all the people in the experiment in, in the line gave the wrong answer before. And so they were, they were basically, their eyes could see that it was longer or whatever, but they wanted to fit in because everyone else said they were all the same length. And so they, they did that. Milgram's research was with regard to the shocking. I'm sure you've heard about the story about um, administering shocks and people dialing it up and dialing it up and dialing it up. And people do it, they continue, because as far as they're concerned, they're not hurting the, 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 uh, the subject in the experiment. They are rather obeying the experimenter and feel fealty to the experimenter and therefore keep on cranking up the stuff that would have actually, the juice that would have actually, had it been real, would have actually killed the people in the experiment. Fortunately, these were actors that were being used. So social psychology, in-group favoritism, peer pressure, those are the sorts of things that are used by the industry to get mutual fund registrants to do what is good for the business, which is to maximize profits, which is to say recommend high cost products. High cost products to the investor are also high margin products to the product manufacturer. So there's, there's a real conflict here. So when you start thinking about the misinformation, disinformation dichotomy, what you need to understand is that in my view, financial registrants on the mutual fund side spread misinformation because they honestly believe it's true. They, they for some reason don't know any better. I know you're gonna know better, but I'm not so sure that mu most mutual fund registrants know better they spread misinformation because the industry, the product manufacturers, the people who manufacture mutual funds, you know, I don't want to name names, the product distributors, the people who hire the advisors to sell their products to the firm, and the regulators are all complicit in one way or another of allowing the disinformation to take hold and to persist. The manufacturers and distributors actively talk about things that are false, they spread the disinformation, and the regulators are culpable because they do nothing to disabuse the registrants of these false beliefs that have taken hold. So we've got a real problem here in Canada because four out of five people who have a license to sell investment products are selling them based on information that they believe to be true that is nonetheless conspicuously not true. So if you want to get a sense of who I am, I am the Ignaz Semmelweis of the Canadian investment industry. I'm the guy who's going around saying, ah, but the science shows, you know how Ignaz Semmelweis said, you know, but you know, if you wash your hands, this will work. And he got run out of town. I'm not the most popular guy in the investment industry. Why? Because the investment industry doesn't really care about science or evidence. The investment industry cares about profits. So what they do is designed to keep advisors happy, get them to conform. They will say things like, it doesn't matter. Uh, clients, clients don't care what you know until they, they know that you care. So talk all about their relationship, which is important. I'm not trying to minimize it, but they, they do it to the point where they actively minimize the importance of evidence and facts. And they will do it in such a way that a lot of people don't even realize it. They, do, they, they hide in plain sight. I'll give you one example. Um, lots of firms will say things like, we're heading into a stock picker's market. How many people have ever heard the phrase, we're heading, we're into a stock picker's market? One, two, three, okay. So you know from what I just told you about the sharp evidence that that's impossible. There's never a time over any time frame in any asset class where stock picking is more profitable than simply buying the benchmark, the investable benchmark. 
and yet the industry says that. And ironically, I basically, I always hear them saying we're heading into a stock picker's market. I never hear them say we've just left a stock picker's market because they're trying to get you to engage in stock picking because stock picking is profitable for the industry. So that's the problem that we have. And I wonder if I can maybe stop right there. I think I should stop there and invite you to ask me some questions and then I'll have a few more comments after that. So that's the problem. And I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for solutions for what we can do about that. I'll stop there and I'll take your questions here.